Good evening. It's Friday, October 18th. I'm Max Pringle with Atta Shaheen. Coming up, Vice President Harris and former President Trump hint the campaign trail in Battleground, Michigan, while former President Obama stumps for Harris in Arizona. No sign of the war in the Middle East stopping anytime soon, even after the death of Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar, as both Hezbollah and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel vow to keep going. President Biden meets with allies today in Berlin. He calls for steadfast support for Ukraine in its fight to oust Russia. An evacuation order is in place in the Oakland Hills as a fast-moving grass fire damages homes in the area. And FEMA reports of scammers trying to take advantage of hurricane victims in storm-damaged areas of Florida. These stories and more are coming up from the studios of KPFA in Berkeley. This is the Pacifica Evening News. I'm Max Pringle with Atta Shaheen. Former President Barack Obama was in Arizona today campaigning for Vice President Kamala Harris at a Tucson rally. Obama took aim at former President Trump's vision for the country. We have had enough of arrogance and bumbling and bluster and division. America's ready to turn the page. We're ready for a better story. We are ready for a President Kamala Harris. Obama's appearance in Arizona, one of seven key swing states in this election, comes as Harris has deployed a number of her most powerful surrogates, including former President Clinton, with fewer than 20 days to go until the election. The vice president will appear alongside the former president in Georgia on October 24th and with the former First Lady Michelle Obama in Michigan on October 26th. Trump, meanwhile, is set to campaign in Detroit this evening. Vice President Harris and former President Trump were in Michigan campaigning in the key battleground state today. Michigan, along with Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, is considered a blue wall state. That means it's a traditional Democratic state that could go either way in the election. Harris told supporters in Grand Rapids today that Trump is a threat to American democracy. We are clear. Someone who suggests we should terminate the Constitution of the United States should never again have the privilege of standing behind the seal of the President of the United States. Trump spent 40 minutes this morning with the hosts of the Fox News show Fox and Friends, where he claimed, without any evidence, that a Harris administration would mean wide open borders. They're going to open up the border, and the border is going to be open for four years. You'll have 200 million people come in. We have no idea. Trump will campaign in Detroit tonight, a city he has insulted on numerous occasions as an example of economic failure and high crime. Meanwhile, Israel continues its crippling siege of northern Gaza. Medical sources told Al Jazeera that at least 39 Palestinians were killed today as Israeli tanks reached the center of the Jabalia refugee camp. This amid a telecommunications blackout in Gaza. Israel cut off communications and internet access for the north of the enclave, a move that Hamas described as a systemic Zionist crime. Israel has also been attacking Lebanon and fighting Hezbollah in southern Lebanon for almost three weeks now. Hezbollah has warned of a new phase of war in the wake of Sinwar's killing. Earlier this week, Hezbollah killed killed four Israeli soldiers in a drone strike on Haifa that Israel failed to detect. More from Charles de la Desma. Lebanon's Hezbollah says it's entering a new phase in its fight against invading Israeli troops as the region continues to reckon with Israel's claim that the top Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar had been killed in a battle with Israeli forces in Gaza. Hamas has still not commented on the report, 
but its ally Iran released a statement commemorating the Palestinian militant leader via its mission to the United Nations. Many from the governments of Israeli allies to exhausted residents of Gaza expressed hope that Sinwar's death would pave the way for an end to the war. But Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said in a speech announcing the killing that our war is not ended yet. I'm Charles de Ledesma. President Biden and top administration officials are pushing for a renewed peace effort in the Middle East now that Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar has been killed. More from Sagar Magani. The Biden administration is urging both sides in the Gaza war to parlay the killing of Hamas's top leader into a ceasefire and hostage release deal. The president and Pentagon chief Lloyd Austin say Yahya Sinwar's death makes Israel and the world safer. But beyond that... Let's also make this moment an opportunity. An extraordinary opportunity to achieve a lasting ceasefire. White House National Security spokesman John Kirby says Sinwar was the biggest obstacle to that. It's too soon to know who might replace him. And what that individual uh, may be willing to pursue uh, one way or the other. For now, peace talks remain stalled. We're not in a position right now where... um, Serious negotiations are in the offing. Sagar Megani, Washington. While in Michigan, Harris and and former President Trump both courted Arab American voters who were seen as critical to winning the battleground state in November. Trump was expected to visit a new campaign office in Hamtramck, one of the nation's only Muslim-majority cities. He was joined there by Mayor Amer Ghalib, a Democrat who's endorsed Trump. Meanwhile, three city council members in the same town have endorsed Harris. The vice president began her day in Grand Rapids with a rally with other Democratic leaders. She then went to Lansing, where she spoke at a United Auto Workers Union Hall. Arab Americans have traditionally leaned more Democratic, but the Biden administration's support for Israel in the ongoing war in the Middle East has upset some Arab Americans who think the U.S. should do more to pressure Israel to wind down its military campaign in Gaza and southern Lebanon. Italian Premier Giorgia Maloney is visiting Lebanon as Israel pushes for the removal of U.N. peacekeepers from the south of the country. More from Giles Gibson. Georgia Maloney is the first leader from the 50 countries that contribute to the UN peacekeeping forces to visit Lebanon since the start of Israel's offensive against Hezbollah. The force known as UNIFIL was set up in the late 1970s to confirm the withdrawal of Israeli troops from southern Lebanon. The UN says the IDF has fired on its positions in recent days, injuring multiple troops. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, though, says UN forces are acting as a human shield for Hezbollah. Earlier on Friday, Maloney was in Jordan for talks with King Abdullah about rising tensions in the Middle East. Giles Gibson, London. Hamas has confirmed that its leader Yahya Sinwar was killed by Israeli forces while engaged in battle on the front lines in Rafah. KPFA's Rami al Magari reports from Gaza. Here in the Gaza Strip, Palestinians are mourning Israel's killing of Hamas's influential leader, Yahya al-Sinwar. Om al-Abid is a displaced elderly mother from Rafah City. Honestly, the incident in itself is an honor for us, an honor that the Palestinian people have such heroes. We will continue to resist till the last moment of our lives. As long as women give birth, heroes will remain in place and won't die. We are all sacrifices for Palestine. Others are hopeful Sinwar's death could be a turning point to end the the year-long war in Gaza that's ravaged Gaza and displaced nearly 2 million civilians, killing more than 42,000 Palestinians. Mohammed Sharawi is a displaced resident from the Jabalia refugee camp in northern Gaza Strip. Inshallah, the negotiations will be reactivated and this matter will come to an end by means of Qatari and Egyptian efforts sooner, inshallah. The Islamist Tabas party mourns al Sinwar as a martyr on a long path of the party's fight against the Israeli occupation. In a televised speech from exile, Hamas senior leader Khalil al Haya says that the party's conditions for a ceasefire remain, that Israeli hostages 
should be swept with thousands of Palestinian prisoners and end to the war and the withdrawal of, of all Israeli forces from the Gaza Strip. This will turn a curse into the occupiers of this land. Our Palestinian people, the Arab and Islamic nations, as well as free peoples around the world, the martyrdom of brother leader Sinwar, as well as those leaders of the party who preceded him on the path of honor and liberation, will only strengthen, solidify, and make it more determined to keep up their path. Over the past year of Israel's war on Hamas in the Gaza Strip, Israel assassinated a number of Hamas leaders both inside Gaza and abroad, including Ismail Haniyeh in Tehran, Saleh al aruri in Beirut, as well as senior militants. Following the announcement of Sinwar's killing, Israeli media reports said Israel would consider returning back to mediated ceasefire negotiations. Sinwar, a man of his early 60s, spent 22 years inside Israeli jails before he was released in 2011 within a prisoner's swap deal between Hamas and Israel. Israel has accused Sinwar of orchestrating and leading the October 7 Hamas attack on nearby Israeli towns. For Pacifica Radio, KPFA, I am Rami al Mirari in Gaza. The number of people casting ballots on the first day of early in-person voting in presidential background st battleground state North Carolina exceeded the first day total four years ago, even as Hurricane Helene recovery continues in the mountains. The State Board of Elections said today that a record 353,166 people cast ballots statewide on Thursday. More from Ed Donahue. Early in-person voting has started in Battleground State, North Carolina. Only four voting sites out of the 80 in Western North Carolina are closed because of damage from Hurricane Helene. The line was long at one polling place in hard-hit Asheville. Bill Whalen says he's devoted to casting his vote. Anytime you have something this cataclysmic, uh, it's going to disrupt people's lives. They're trying to figure out how to flush their toilets and uh, you know, take care of basic needs. Another person in line said voting is an important milestone, getting back to normal, whatever that might turn out to be. Whalen says it's a worthwhile break from the cleanup and recovery. At least in my neighborhood, there's a widespread understanding of the importance of this election and how important it is to vote. Thousands in western North Carolina are still without power or clean running water. I'm Ed Donahue. President Biden is in Berlin today, meeting with European partners. Biden impressed on Western allies the importance of maintaining support for Ukraine and its fight to repel Russia's invasion and to look for ways to end the war in the Middle East. Jennifer King reports. In the twilight of his presidency less than three weeks before the U.S. elections, President Biden is taking a victory lap in Germany before heading to Camp David later today. After a welcome ceremony at Bellevue Palace in Berlin, German President Frank-Walter Steinmeier awarded Biden the Order of Merit for his contribution to transatlantic relations. You, Mr. President, have been the beacon of democracy. Also on the agenda, meetings with Chancellor Olaf Scholz, French President Emmanuel Macron, and UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer to discuss Ukraine and the Middle East. As Ukraine faces a tough winter, we must, we must sustain our resolve, our effort, and our support. Biden spoke at a joint news conference with Schulz. Let's also make this moment an opportunity to seek a path to peace, a better future in Gaza without Hamas. I'm Jennifer King. Russia has returned to Ukraine the bodies of 501 soldiers in what appears to be the biggest repatriation of war dead since Russia's full-scale invasion in February 2022. Ukrainian authorities said law enforcement agencies and forensic experts will identify the victims who will then be handed to family for burial. The war is believed to have killed tens of thousands of soldiers on each side, though there are no official or independently collated figures. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky this week disclosed parts of, the, of his so-called victory plan aimed at compelling Russia to end the war through negotiations. That proposal is being considered by Ukraine's Western partners 
whose help is vital for Kyiv to resist its bigger neighbor. Trent Murray has more on President Biden's trip to Germany from Berlin. Well, President Biden has spent much of the day talking with Olaf Scholz here at the German Chancellery. We know that this is widely expected to be the president's last visit to Europe as he stares down the barrel of his final few months in office. Ukraine high on the agenda. President Biden said it was essential for NATO to continue to sustain its support for Ukraine as it tries to push back Russian forces in its country. Olaf Scholz, also speaking about the invasion of Ukraine, said that it had shaken the European security order to its foundation. This visit by President Biden also being used to shore up the transatlantic relationship with France and the United Kingdom, with both President Macron and UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer paying a visit to the German capital to speak with both the Chancellor and the President. And that's Trent Murray. South Korea's spy agency says North Korea has dispatched troops to support Russia's war against Ukraine. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says his intelligence service has also reported the troop deployment. More from Megumi Lim in Kyiv. Zelensky said North Korea's participation was the first step to a world war. His statement comes after reports have been circulating recently of North Korea's greater involvement in Russia's full-scale invasion. North Korea has already been supplying Russia with ballistic missiles and artillery shells. Russian President Vladimir Putin and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un signed a mutual defense treaty in June during a summit in Pyongyang. According to the treaty, both countries are to provide immediate military assistance to the other party if it falls into a state of war due to armed invasion from an individual or multiple states. That's Megumi Lim in Kyiv. Fears of violence and intimidation at polling places has prompted many election officials to begin making security a priority ahead of Election Day. More from Terry D. This year's Election Day will be one of the most closely watched in history, and one concern of Illinois election officials is safety at polling sites. The latest Brennan Center for Justice study shows since 2020, 92% of election officials nationwide have increased security for their workers and volunteers, as well as voters. The steps include forming emergency response plans and extra security at polling sites and election offices. Ed Yanka with the ACLU of Illinois says the fears are valid. One of the things that we will be doing in Illinois and around the country is monitoring to assure that there is not violence or intimidation at the polls. Everybody, everybody, no matter who they support, has a right to go and vote and participate in this election on behalf of the candidate they support. One tool of voter suppression is to create anxiety, Yanka adds. The ACLU of Illinois is encouraging people to prepare for Election Day in advance by having their proper ID with them and knowing how to obtain a provisional ballot if their name does not appear on a voting roster. When people or groups position themselves near polling places to intimidate or threaten others, the goal may be to ultimately discourage people from voting at all. These actions may involve videotaping prospective voters as they approach a polling site or taking pictures of their license plates. Deceptive robocalls or targeting people of color are also forms of voter intimidation. Yanka says these occurrences, quote, get into the wheelhouse of the work the ACLU has done for more than a century. We're here to defend the civil liberties and civil rights of everyone, no matter who's the president, no matter who is in power in Congress, no matter who's in power at the state level. It gives us the capacity and the ability to challenge abuses, whether they come from either one of the major parties in power. He emphasizes the ACLU is nonpartisan and does not have a direct role in the electoral process. But he adds people must know their rights and how to exercise them and not be intimidated. I'm Terry D. reporting. U.S. stocks rose to records to close out their latest winning week. The S&P 500 climbed 0.4 percent today to squeak past the all-time high it had set earlier in the week. The Dow Jones Industrial Average added 0.1 percent to its own record set the day before, And the NASDAQ composite gained 0.6 percent. 
Netflix helped drive the market after the streaming giant reported stronger profit for the latest quarter than analysts had expected. It marked a sixth straight winning week for the S&P 500, its longest such streak of the year. Treasury yields eased a bit in the bond market. The Biden administration is shelling out billions of dollars for clean energy and approving major offshore wind projects as officials race to secure major climate initiatives before President Biden's term comes to an end. Biden wants to establish a legacy for climate action that includes locking in a a trajectory for reducing the nation's planet-warming greenhouse gas emissions. Former President Donald Trump has pledged to rescind unspent funds in Biden's landmark climate and health care bill and stop offshore wind development if he returns to the White House. Vice President Kamala Harris has said she will pursue a climate agenda similar to Biden's. Announcements of major environmental grants and project approvals have speeded up in recent months. Residents in the East Oakland Hills had to evacuate their homes this afternoon after a four-alarm brush fire broke out just above Highway 580 in the Ridgemont and Sequoia Heights neighborhoods. The evacuation orders apply to areas adjacent to Keller Avenue, as well as areas along Campus Drive near Caballo Hills. The evacuation areas are bounded to the west by 580, The Oakland Fire Department said they were on the scene at around 1.30. Cal Fire shows the blaze has grown to about 15 acres, and they still have it 0% contained at last update. Four-alarm fires are rare and considered severe and dangerous. They typically require coordinated response with many crews from multiple departments. Cal Fire showed, showed multiple air units were on the scene today, The cause of the fire is under investigation. No word yet on injuries or the structures affected. High winds appear to be a factor. The Berkeley Fire Department issued a warning declaring extreme fire weather lasting overnight into tomorrow morning with gusts of up to 30 miles per hour. Alameda County said these conditions have not been seen since October of 2020. More from Lisa Dwyer. A fast-moving brush fire in Northern California damaged four structures on the hills of Oakland, prompting an evacuation order. The fire is burning in the Oakland Hills, where a 1991 fire destroyed nearly 3,000 homes and killed 25 people. Forecasters have issued red flag warnings for fire danger until Saturday. As a precaution, a California utility shut off power in 19 counties as a major Diablo wind spiked the risk of power lines sparking a wildfire. I'm Lisa Dwyer. In Cuba, uh, the electrical grid has gone offline after one of the island's major power plants failed and as a massive blackout swept across the Caribbean island. Cuba's energy ministry said that the grid had gone down hours after it said the Antonio Gutierrez plant had ceased operations at about 11 a.m. local time. Authorities said at the time it was only offline temporarily. Hours earlier, Prime Minister Manuel Marrero had sought to assuage concerned citizens about the outage that began Thursday evening. Some 10 million Cubans were left without power prompting the government today to implement emergency measures to slash demand, including suspending classes, shutting down some of state-owned workplaces, and canceling non-essential services. Up in California, PG&E today shut off power to about 16,000 customers in northern and central California to prevent its equipment from sparking wildfires amid the dry weather and strong winds that are expected to last through part of the weekend. More on that from Ben Thomas. Forecasters have issued red flag warnings for fire danger until Saturday from California's central coast up to nearly the Oregon border. A weather event called the Diablo wind is expected, causing humidity levels to drop and raising the risk of wildfires. The National Weather Service says sustained winds reaching 35 miles per hour are expected across many areas, with possible gusts topping 65 along mountaintops. 
Meantime, another notorious weather phenomenon. The Santa Ana winds are expected Friday and Saturday in Southern California. Winds around LA won't be as powerful, but the National Weather Service says gusts up to 40 miles per hour are possible in the mountains and foothills. Pacific Gas and Electric says it's prepared to make targeted power shutoffs. I'm Ben Thomas. The emergency management chief of the Florida County, where Hurricane Milton made landfall earlier this month, is warning about reports of scammers who are posing as federal emergency management agency officials and trying to get financial information from the storm's victims. Sarasota County Emergency Management Chief Sandra Tufumini told residents Thursday that some scammers with fake FEMA badges were asking residents for bank account information, which they should never provide. FEMA will never ask you for your bank account information to be able to wire you money. Um, that is something that they are going to direct you to do information on an online system. So if you don't give out your banking information to anybody that is coming to knock at your door, um, that is not um, an indication that they are there to help you. She says hurricane victims seeking help should only share that on FEMA's online system. She says residents with any doubts about the authenticity of a FEMA worker should contact local authorities. The San Francisco Board of Supervisors has authorized a proposed Cash Not Drugs Sobriety and Recovery Pilot Program. It's a voluntary three-year treatment initiative aimed at supporting residents struggling with addiction. Sponsored by Supervisors Matt Dorsey, Raphael Mandelman, and Asha Safai, the ordinance amends the city's administrative code to encourage sobriety through financial incentives. The program will offer eligible beneficiaries of the county adult assistant programs a weekly payment of $100 for producing negative drug tests. It's designed to motivate people to stay clean. The pilot also includes a six-month implementation plan that targets homelessness and supports the 5,500 low-income residents receiving benefits. Susie Smith, Deputy Director of Policy Planning and Public Affairs at the San Francisco Human Services Agency, said the department has been working on implementation planning for cash, not drugs. The voter-approved Prop F has a new requirement, as you all know, which is to require people who receiving CAP to engage in some sort of treatment, broadly defined, um, if uh, a substance use disorder is um, suspected and confirmed upon evaluation. So we've been partnering with experts at the Department of Public Health and community providers over the last several months to plan for this uh, implementation and to identify a range of treatment options um, and approaches that would make sense for this, this pathway. Gary McCoy is Vice President of Policy and Public Affairs for Health Right 360. He stressed the importance of the program pointing to the rising deaths from methamphetamine and fentanyl. He emphasized that San Francisco cannot afford to ignore strategies that help residents achieve sobriety and lead healthier lives. This September, San Francisco recorded more overdose deaths involving meth than fentanyl. Because smaller contingency management, management models have been focused on stimulant use, the timing of this legislation couldn't be more critical. We stand behind this proposal and are confident in San Francisco's ability to deliver on its potential. By passing this ordinance, we can provide more opportunities for success in the lives of people who use drugs, allowing them to live a healthier life without substances. San Francisco resident Billy Lemon spoke in support of the program and shared his personal experience with sobriety and how testing negative for drugs can provide an empowering sense of achievement. Additional services like support, support groups, the process is really easy for folks to access. As an example, um, when I accessed PROP at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation in 2013, I had been using nothing but burner phones in my previous life, right? Over the four, four weeks, six weeks that I was enrolled in PROP, I was able to save the money that was put into the account for prop, and week by week, I was able to recognize that I was able to be abstinence, abstinent from meth. 
A similar program through the Department of Veterans Affairs launched in 2011 showed great success in its first five years, with over 90% of the samples tested during that period coming back negative for drugs. The Federal Road Safety Agency is investigating car company Tesla's full driving system. The agency says it opened the probe yesterday after Tesla reported four crashes in low visibility conditions like fog or sun glare. One of the crashes killed a pedestrian. The investigation applies to nearly 2.5 million Teslas from 2016 to 2024. Tesla has repeatedly said that the full self-driving system cannot drive itself and that human drivers must be ready to intervene at all times. The United Nations held a special conference on freedom of expression this week. It came the day after U.K. authorities raided the home of a reporter who's been critical of Israel's war in Gaza. The arrests were made under the country's Terrorism Act, which has seen an uptick in enforcement. Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression Irene Khan is an independent expert on the Human Rights Council. Khan delivered her report to the U.N. General Assembly on the treatment of journalists on the ground in the Palestinian territories. We all know the deliberate killing of a journalist is a war crime, yet not a single killing of a journalist this past year or, for that matter, in previous years in the occupied Palestinian territory has ever been properly investigated, prosecuted, or punished. Impunity is total. Khan's report stated that platforms have allowed advertisements dehumanizing Palestinians, including from state actors, even when they appear to violate the terms of service of platforms. YouTube, she said, reportedly accepted $7.1 million in advertisements sponsored by the government of Israel, primarily targeted at audiences in Western Europe and the U.S., Khan said some of them could constitute incitement to violence, labeling Palestinians as, quote, barbaric terrorists and featuring graphic, bloody material. In her briefing, Khan said that journalists need the same protections as humanitarians. The right to information is a survival right in times of conflict. And in that kind of a situation, I believe journalists need specific, clear protection uh, in the same way that other humanitarian uh, workers receive, and journalism should be seen as essential as uh, the humanitarian work. Khan emphasized the importance of freedom of expression as a pathway to peaceful resolution of conflicts. History has shown us the freedom of opinion and expression, when enjoyed equally by all, is a valuable tool for fighting hatred, building trust, uh, encouraging dialogue, rather than violence as a means of resolving dispute. And what... Given what we are seeing now happening in the Middle East, I believe freedom of expression is more important than ever, not just in the Middle East, but around the world on these issues, so that people can come around the table, talk about it, resolve disputes, rather than applying discriminatory measures that shut down one side and only favor another. The report came on the heels of the British authorities raiding the home of the Electronic Intifada's associate editor, Asa Wynn Stanley. The police seized several of his electronic devices and claimed that his social media posts were encouraging terrorism. Electronic Intifada is aired on Pacifica Radio and co-hosted by a former host of Flashpoints, Nora Barrows-Friedman. According to the Electronic Intifada's website, quote, Approximately 10 officers arrived at Win Stanley's North London home before 6 a.m. and served the journalist with warrants and other papers authorizing them to search his house and vehicle for devices and documents, unquote. A letter addressed to Win Stanley from the UK's Counterterrorism Command, which is a part of the Metropolitan Police Service, showed authorities were aware that he was a journalist, but that, quote, Notwithstanding, police are investigating possible offenses under Sections 1 and 2 of the Terrorism Act containing the offense of encouragement of terrorism. Electronic Intifada posted Wynne Stanley's response to the raid 
on his home via social media platform X. He said, among other things, quote, journalism is not a crime. No arrests were made in the raid of Win Stanley's home. In recent months, he reported on arrests and raids by counterterrorism police targeting other journalists and pro-Palestinian activists. He's been writing about Palestinian-Israeli relations for over a decade. The superintendent of San Francisco Unified School District is expected to resign this evening amid a financial crisis for the district and the controversial plan to close many school campuses. The school board is holding an emergency meeting where they will vote on a separation agreement tied to the departure of Superintendent Matt Wayne. Earlier this week, SF Mayor London Breed said she had, quote, lost confidence in Wayne, stemming from his handling of the planned closure of the school campuses. Last week, SFUSD released the long-awaited list of about a dozen schools to close. The list included incorrect test score data, and critics of the closures say it disproportionately affects the southeast corner of the city, which is the blackest neighborhood in the city and historically disenfranchised. The schools are set to close at the end of the year, although Mayor Breed called for Wayne to, quote, immediately stop the process of closures. Matt Wayne held the position for two years, during which the district saw declining enrollment and a worsening financial crisis that triggered state regulators to step in and oversee spending decisions. Tennessee has expanded food assistance for Northeast Tennessee residents still cleaning up after Hurricane Helene. More from Danielle Smith. What's known as the Disaster Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or DSNAP, is in effect for current SNAP recipients in the eight counties affected. Signe Anderson with the Tennessee Justice Center says DSNAP benefits are provided through an electronic debit card and can be used to purchase food items at grocery stores and other authorized retailers who accept electronic benefit transfer. The state has been able to secure an automatic mass re- reimbursement of 65% to uh, SNAP participants who are already part of the program. So uh, with the knowledge that so many people lost power, there was major devastation. The Tennessee Department of Human Services has also temporarily allowed SNAP recipients in 13 counties to use their benefits to purchase hot foods due to the challenges of hurricane recovery. Anderson thinks a 65% reimbursement is a good start, but says the USDA approved more waivers for households to get the full 100% reimbursement back by filling out an affidavit on its website. The waiver covers Carter, Hopkins, Johnson, Unicoil, and Washington counties. She adds Cock, Green, and Hamblin were not approved in the waiver. The state did say even if you're not in one of these listed counties, but you're in one of those bordering counties, you should apply through the affidavit and, and make your case. So unfortunately, those individuals in, in the surrounding counties aren't automatically reimbursed, but if they re- out to DHS through the affidavit, they're likely to, to get help. She says President Joe Biden's FEMA disaster declaration allows the state to do even more. The assistance includes grants for temporary housing and home repairs, low-cost loans to cover uninsured property losses, and other programs to help individuals and business owners recover from the effects of the disaster. For Public News Service, I'm Danielle Smith. Puerto Rico is looking towards solar and other green energy sources as part of its effort to make its energy grid more climate resilient. Tramel Gomes has more. In preparation for future storms, a parish in Puerto Rico, Nuestro Sonora del Carmen Parish in Catano, has installed a solar power system, positioning itself as a vital climate resilience hub for the local community. This coastal community is taking proactive steps to ensure it can remain a beacon of support during the increasing threats of hurricanes. Speaking on a webinar, David Ortiz, Puerto Rico Director of Solar United Neighbors says there is a critical need for resilience following the devastation of Hurricane Maria in 2017. There were over 4,600 deaths. People lost electricity from three months to a year. Many also lost water from three to six months. 
flooding devastating many towns and municipalities, including Cataño. The parish's new solar installation, completed in March, is designed to sustain high winds and keep the church operational in the event of a power outage. A key aspect of the Resilience Hub is its ability to support vulnerable members of the community during emergencies to access things like electricity, shelter, and drinking water. The parish's solar system features advanced technology to ensure consistent power, even in challenging conditions. Ortiz says each panel has its own microinverter, which means that even if one panel is damaged, the rest of the system will continue to function. You know, these weather events are getting more and more uh, 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 stronger every time, but it's what we do day one that uh, starts to prepare us to become much more resilient. Um, and be able to, to weather these events. The parish's solar system will play a key role in helping fortify the community's preparedness for the next big storm. This is Tremel Gomes for Public News Service. Assailants have fired a dozen gunshots at a building housing the newspaper El Debate in the embattled northern Mexican state of Sinaloa. The newspaper is based in the state capital, Culiacan, where rival factions of the Sinaloa cartel have been staging bloody battles. The newspaper said today that it found at least four bullet impacts on the building's walls, and more bullets hit newspaper vehicles parked in the front. The paper said no one was injured in late Thursday's shooting. Threats against journalists and their sources have increased exponentially, since the latest round of factional fighting broke out after the arrest of two Sinaloa drug capos. The journalism group Reporters Without Borders ranks Mexico as the most dangerous place in the Americas to be a journalist. New accusations against disgraced record executive Sean Diddy Combs connect him to a violent group sexual assault in the Bay Area. The lawsuit alleges Combs and his entourage assaulted a woman in an Orenda apartment after she made comments about Combs being involved in the killing of Tupac Shakur. Combs is already charged with sex trafficking, among other things. The battleground state of Pennsylvania is short on poll workers for next month's presidential election. Election observers in that state say the shortage could affect how smoothly the election goes in Pennsylvania. Danielle Smith has more. Election day is less than three weeks away, and while the focus for most people is on casting their ballot, Pennsylvania also needs a lot more poll workers for the voting process to go smoothly. Many of the 8.7 million registered voters in the state would be eligible to work at the polls for the November 5th presidential election. Susan Gobreski with the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania says prospective poll workers need to be registered to vote in the county where they want to work and would need to be available for the entire day. There are over 9,000 precincts or divisions in Pennsylvania, and there are about five poll workers per precinct or division, plus translators in some places. So it's over 45,000 people who are needed. She adds poll workers are appointed by the community, are elected every four years, and are essential for ensuring the transparency and fairness of elections. Gobreski says they come from diverse backgrounds and are responsible for administering the voting process and filling in when any vacancies arise. Gobreski stresses that Pennsylvania prioritizes the safety of poll workers and has implemented measures to ensure a seamless election process. If you're concerned about political violence, I think for the most part, that is something that people should learn about de-escalation. People can always call the police. Um, election officials and safety officials are responsible for administering that and addressing those situations. So poll workers aren't expected to resolve those situations. She says election workers are paid, but the exact rates vary by county. Training is offered prior to working on election day. The hours may start as early as 6.30 a.m. and polls close at 8 p.m. For Public News Service, I'm Danielle Smith. The Wyoming Episcopal Church recently returned over 200 sacred native cultural artifacts to the northern Arapaho tribe. They'd been in the church's possession for almost eight decades. Hannah Haberman has more. A couple hundred people gathered in a grassy field at St. Michael's Circle in Ethity for a coming home celebration. 
This is very historical for us to get our artifacts back. That's Northern Arapaho elder Marion Scott addressing the crowd. I am just so proud that they are back home and uh, they're going to stay here with us now. Over a plate of stew and bread after the ceremony, Northern Arapaho member Jordan Dresser called it a full circle moment. I feel lucky to have been a part of this journey, but also to see it complete is something I never thought would happen. And moving forward? I'm just excited for what's the next possibilities, which is creating a museum where we tell who we are as Arapaho people. I'm Hannah Haberman on the Wind River Reservation. Native Americans living on reservations and colonies in Nevada are now among the roughly 300,000 Americans who can cast a ballot online. Nevada Public Radio's Paul Boger reports. The Native American Rights Fund estimates that the average turnout among indigenous voters during the last six election cycles was 37 percent. Turnout among white voters averaged around 51 percent. One reason is that tribal communities have faced historical and geographic obstacles to casting a ballot, including a lack of polling locations and unreliable mail service. It's one of the day-to-day challenges that you come to accept. That's Brian Mason, chairman of the Shoshone Paiute Tribes of the Duck Valley Reservation, which straddles the Nevada-Idaho state line. In previous elections, the nearest polling location was open only on Election Day, two hours away. Mason says a lot of people didn't get a chance to vote. You know, in the past, it's been, well, if you couldn't make it to Elko, then you just didn't make it to Elko. This year, voters living on the Duck Valley Reservation or any of the 27 other tribal communities in the state can vote online using Nevada's Digital Effective Absentee System for Elections, or EASE for short. The state developed it in 2014 to allow members of the armed forces overseas and others to cast absentee ballots online. Matilda Miller is with Native Voters Alliance of Nevada, one of the organizations that pushed for the expansion. She says ease, along with voting by mail, allows Native voters in Nevada to have their voices heard like never before. I think it's a great opportunity, and I think it's great to see that this this voting tool is being expanded to our people. Opponents of electronic voting have expressed doubts about the ease system security. For Miller, those concerns are part of an effort to continue disenfranchising Native voters. I'm hoping that with more years, more elections, and the more education that's going to continue to happen, that more people are able to take advantage of the system. As for in-person voting, the Nevada Secretary of State's office says there'll be 18 polling locations open on tribal land on Election Day, as well as 12 early voting locations and eight ballot drop boxes available to Native voters throughout the state. For National Native News, I'm Paul Boger in Reno. A lawsuit accusing social media companies of harming the mental health of Native American youth is making its way through the courts. The suit names social media giants like TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. More from Brian Bull. CBS News says the case was heard Monday in Minneapolis. The 164-page suit was filed by Minnesota's Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin, and two other tribes in the Dakotas. The defendants include Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, and YouTube. The suit claims parent companies to these popular social media sites, including Alphabet, ByteDance, Meta, and Snap, violated Minnesota's laws against public nuisance, negligence, deceptive trade practices, and unfair or unconscionable acts. The allegations further say the social media companies failed to warn users of negative mental health consequences associated with social media use, especially for children and adolescents. It claims the companies knew the more time spent on the platform, the more likely users would see content that is violent, sexual, or encouraged self-harm. Native Americans suffer higher rates of suicide than other demographics in the U.S., according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. CBS affiliate WCCO said an Alphabet representative said the allegations were untrue and that providing young users with a safer and healthier experience has always been at their core. WCCO also reached out to ByteDance, Meta, and Snap, but did not hear back. This is National Native News. I'm Brian Bull. The Supreme Court heard arguments Wednesday in an appeal of an environmental case that at least some city city leaders are desperately hoping to lose. That's San Francisco. That's because the unusual case involving sewage discharges into the Pacific Ocean has put San Francisco in league with the oil and gas industries. It's queuing up a fight that the court's 6-3 to three conservative supermajority may use to weaken clean water regulations nationally. 
The Board of Supervisors voted 8-2 to two last week to urge city officials to resolve the suit quickly, warning that a Supreme Court ruling in its favor could, in its words, greatly harm water quality nationwide. That resolution was not binding, however, and the city attorney's The city attorney said he has no intention of backing down. The fight is over San Francisco's sewer system, which, like many cities, is unable to fully treat all of its wastewater after heavy storms. When one of its treatment facilities reaches capacity, the city winds up pumping barely treated sewage into the Pacific Ocean. For decades, the EPA set limits under the Clean Water Act on how much untreated sewage the city could dump into the sea, But in 2019, federal regulators also required the city to meet two generic provisions, including a requirement that any discharges, quote, not cause or contribute to a violation of any applicable water quality standard for receiving waters. City Attorney David Chu said EPA's requirements make San Francisco liable for enforcement actions without providing specific targets for how much sewage is too much. And that, he said, puts San Francisco on the hook for the overall water quality of the Pacific Ocean. Canada's foreign minister says India's remaining diplomats in the country are clearly on notice not to endanger Canadian lives. Her comments today come after New Delhi's top envoy in Canada was named the person of interest in the assassination of a Sikh activist. India's high commissioner was expelled Monday along with five other Indian diplomats prompting Canadian Foreign Minister Melanie Jolie to compare India to Russia, saying Canada's National Police Force has linked Indian diplomats to homicides, death threats, and intimidation in Canada. India, in turn, expelled several top Canadian diplomats. Jolie said today that Canada won't tolerate foreign diplomats putting the lives of Canadian citizens at risk. An expert committee reviewing euthanasia deaths in Canada's most populous province of Ontario has identified several cases where patients asked to be killed in part for social reasons, such as isolation and fear of homelessness. It shows rising concerns over approvals for vulnerable people in the country's assisted dying system. Ontario's chief coroner issued several reports this week after an Associated Press investigation. They review euthanasia deaths of people who weren't terminally ill. The reports are based on the committee's analysis of anonymized cases. Canada's legal criteria require a medical reason for euthanasia. That can be a fatal diagnosis or unmanageable pain. But the reports show cases of euthanasia based on other factors, including an unmet social need. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is reporting an unexpected drop in U.S. drug overdose deaths appearing to be taking place. The CDC reports that fatal overdoses are down 12.7 percent. It marks another significant improvement from last month when surveys showed a 10.6 percent drop in fatalities from street drugs, Experts say the drop in street drug mortality marks a dramatic reversal from just a few years ago, when fatal overdoses were spiraling upwards at devastating speed, fueled largely by the spread of deadly street fentanyl. It's not clear why the number of deaths have fallen over the past year. Researchers say one person could be a drop in the availability, one reason that is, could be a drop in the availability and purity of fentanyl available on U.S. streets. October is a National Seafood Month, and the fish on your plate is more than likely not wild-caught, but instead comes from a fish farm located abroad. More from Eric Tegadoff. The U.S. imports 90% of the seafood it consumes. Offshore fish farming has come to dominate wild harvest in recent decades, with farmed salmon making up 80% of global salmon supply. Oregon doesn't have regulations that stop the practice. And Johnny Fishmonger with Wild Salmon Nation says legislation proposed in Congress could make fish farming more prevalent in federal waters. He compares large-scale fish farming practices to dairy and poultry farms. It's like on land, concentrated animal feedlot operations, CAPO. So concentrated aquaculture feedlot operations where the fish are farmed intensively in high densities. 
Fishmonger notes that sea lice infestations are common and devastating problems for fish farms. The Aqua Act would allow aquaculture companies three miles offshore in federal waters. The Seafood Act would create aquaculture assessment and grant programs. Supporters of large aquaculture operations say they're needed to feed the world's population. Fishmonger says the aquaculture companies that want to operate in federal waters are not mom-and-pop operations. One of the real distressing parts of that is there's no such thing as a small family-owned fish farm except for like trout farms on land. Every farm in the ocean has been taken over by huge multinational corporations. Rob Seitz is a fish boat captain who opened South Bay Wild Fish House in Astoria. He says there is other legislation that could boost his line of work, the Domestic Seafood Production Act. The bill would require congressional approval for offshore aquaculture operations and invest in local fishing communities. Seitz says fewer fish farms would be good for the environment. Wild catch fishing has the lowest carbon footprint of any form of food production, and all of our fisheries in this country are sustainable pretty much now. I'm Eric Tegedoff reporting. A rare copy of the U.S. Constitution that was sent to the 13 states for ratification has sold for $9 million in North Carolina. The document was found inside a filing cabinet at a property once owned by a former North Carolina governor. More from Donna Warder. A copy of the U.S. Constitution is going up for auction this evening. Andrew Brunk of Brunk Auctions in Asheville, North Carolina, says the document was found at a property once owned by Samuel Johnston, who was North Carolina's governor from 1787 to 1789. For this document to go sort of unrecognized and uh, hidden away for 237 years, um, tucked away in a historic house in North Carolina, It's uh, exciting to everyone involved. Brunk says the copy is rare because it was signed by Secretary Charles Thompson, who signed two copies for each of the 13 states to ratify. We don't know what it's worth. Uh, The last one that came to market, as far as we can tell, was in 1893. Um, That was the last chance anyone had to to buy a copy like this. Um, So it's selling without reserve. The opening bid is a million dollars. I'm Donna Warder. Three large tobacco companies would pay nearly $24 billion to settle a long-running legal battle in Canada under a proposed deal. The money would be used to compensate victims of tobacco-related illnesses. Tobacco giant Philip Morris International said today that a court-appointed mediator had filed the proposed settlement with its Canadian affiliate, Rothmans, Benson & Hodges, over tobacco product-related claims and litigation in Canada. Similar deals were also filed covering JTI McDonald Corp. and Imperial Tobacco Canada LTD. The three tobacco companies had sought creditor protection in Ontario in early 2019 after they had lost an appeal in a landmark court battle in Quebec. In Los Angeles, police arrested a man accused of drugging and sexually assaulting at least nine women, including one victim who died from the drugging. The 50-year-old suspect of Redondo Beach is charged with multiple counts of rape and one count of murder. He faces a maximum life sentence if convicted. Partly cloudy tonight in the San Francisco Bay Area. Lows tonight in the 50s. Sunny tomorrow, highs in the 80s. In the central San Joaquin Valley, clear with overnight lows in the 50s. Tomorrow, sunny with highs around 80. That's it for the news tonight. I'm Max Pringle with Atta Shaheen. Rod Akeel is at the controls. Good evening. Theater, Arenas Dance Company, and Dunia Dance and Drum Company invite you to the world premiere of Reises et Resistance, a vibrant and exciting performance featuring a world class Ghanaian and Cuban ensemble of 30 dancers and musicians. Performances are October 11th through the 20th at Dance Mission Theater in San Francisco. For more information, visit dancemissiontheater.org. This event is wheelchair accessible.
You are listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org.